Good morning, everyone. It's great to see all of you. Um, if you don't know this by now, I hope you do. If, if you don't know this, it's probably because you're new, but um, I'm a huge 49er fan. Any other ones? Yes, yeah. This is why I don't think I could ever minister like in Seattle or other terrible places like that, just because it'd be so different for me. Um, and since we're in the middle of the football season... I want to start off with a challenging illustration that I heard this week that I've just been thinking about all week. Um, and I want you to imagine this game this afternoon, all right? And uh, so the 49ers, they, they run out on the field, and we have our new quarterback, Brock Purdy. Let's go, Brock. But by the way, I've heard he's a believer, so Team Jesus, great. Um, and I want you to imagine, what if he ran up and, you know, they get down, he pulls out that humongous, like, thing, and just, you know, they call, he calls the play. And they all say, break! That's what you do. And then instead of running out to the line to run the play, what would you think if they then ran to the sidelines, took off their helmets, and started drinking Gatorade? You know, one time, you'd be like, that's a little weird, but whatever, maybe they just, you know, it's Brock, he's like, you know, first, first start ever. But then the second play came, and, 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 and they did the same thing. They run out onto the field. They gather around. He calls a play. Break! And again, instead of running to the line to run the play, the entire offense ran back to the sideline, took off their hel helmets, grabbed a seat, and started drinking Gatorade. Now, what if that happened for all three hours of the football game this afternoon? It's, it'd be ridiculous, right? Like, you would not put up with that. If you're at the game, you would quickly leave, right? If you're watching TV, you would quickly change the channel to a team that was actually running the plays. Because you, run, you play football to run plays, to win the game, right? Because in football, the huddle is just a small, small part of the game, right? Right? But it's necessary, but it's a small part of the game. Now, I say all that to say this. Unfortunately, the church can feel a lot like a huddle sometimes. I mean, think about it. We gather here and we huddle up every Sunday morning. And most of you, I think maybe all of you, come excited to worship in song, to hear the Bible preached, to connect with other believers, to check your kids into our ministry, all those things. And, and I guess in some ways I'm the quarterback, you know, and, 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 and I call the play and the sermon is preached. And for the most part, I think most of you would say, yeah, that guy's pretty inspiring. And I sometimes get challenged by him or encouraged, you know. And the play might be about, I don't know, prayer or discipleship or generosity or faith or getting together in community or fellowship or, or, or serving the Lord or, or some other aspect of the Christian life. And then we end and we all say, break, and we leave the huddle. And then we walk out those doors and then we go to our jobs or to our workplaces, or to our schools, and Monday through Saturday, we don't run the play at all. And guess what? I'm at fault for doing this at times too, right? But then, you know, Saturday night comes, we gotta all go get, we gotta get back to church and we gotta get back to our holy huddle and we get back to our holy huddle and we're inspired and we're encouraged and we're excited and, and the pastors, one of our teaching pastors calls the play and we say, break, and then we go out and forget what the pastor talked about or what the challenge was, right? Or we try and it just doesn't work out and then we wonder, and then we wonder, gosh, like, why, why am I not changing or growing. Or, or we look at our communities or our workplaces and go, man, like, why don't they care about our holy huddles either? See, this is one of the many reasons why the Apostle James put it so clearly in James chapter 1. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. But what does it say? What? Do what it says. Right? Because faith must be put into action for faith to be realized. Like, I mean, just think about Christmas for a second. Can you imagine if Joseph just listened to the angel and said, yeah, you know what, angel? 
yeah, I just don't agree with you. Yeah, I'm not gonna do that. You know, I hear what you're saying, and I know you're speaking for God, but this whole immaculate conception stuff, you know, I just don't believe it, right? So I'm not gonna marry Mary. Can you imagine? Or consider the words of Jesus, right? We love these words. We love this play, right? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We love it. But look at verse 20. And teaching them a bunch of information so their heads will get really, really big. No, it doesn't say that. And teaching them to what? Obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So Jesus actually wanted us, churches, holy huddles, to be teaching not just for information, but teaching that leads towards obedience. Yes, go, make disciples, but teach for obedience, not just knowledge. And again, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, it's actually not enough to come to our holy huddles on Sundays once or twice a month or online occasionally or whatever your rhythm is and to hear the play only to run back to the sidelines and take a seat next to the water cooler. God's kingdom doesn't work that way. See, God wants you, actually, and I to experience his kingdom as well. God wants you, actually, and I to exercise our faith muscles and to put into practice the things that you are learning, both here and in your midweek ministries and community groups or whatever, because that's how we mature and grow in the Christian faith. And I say all that because at this point in the book of Mark that we've been studying so far, it's been roughly about a year And Jesus has been teaching the disciples. He's taught them all kinds of amazing things. And he's been showing them exactly what the kingdom of God is like. like. Remember, the kingdom of God is, I like to put it this way, it's it's what life is like when God is in charge. In charge, right? And so Jesus has healed all kinds of people. He's cast out demons. He's calmed storm. He's done miracle after miracle. And the disciples are like, whoa, this is incredible. I love this. This is awesome. But then now, Jesus wants to prepare the disciples for life and for ministry without him. Jesus wanted to give the disciples a chance to play in his kingdom mission too. And so he gathered them together, he calls a huddle, and then he sends them out to run the play. Let's look at this huddle and the play that Jesus called. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to uh, Mark chapter 6, and I'll be looking in part of verse 6, Mark chapter 6. And actually, since uh, your behinds might be getting a little numb, let's stand real quick in honor of God's word, and I'm just going to read the first couple verses here of our passage. Mark chapter 6. The second part starts this way. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the 12 to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. And these were his instructions. This was the play call. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, No bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. And whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. And they went out, and they ran the play, and they preached that people should repent, and they drove out many demons, and they anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Now look over way down to uh, verse 30. After the play called, after they ran the play, verse 30 says, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. This is the word of God. You may be seated. So here's what Jesus does, right? He called the 12 together, his disciples. He huddled them up. He told them the first thing, he says, hey, I'm gonna send you guys out two by two, right? So do your math, that's six different pairs being sent out two by two. This was a very practical strategy. There would be accountability and camaraderie and support in twos. And also, according to Old Testament law, it took two people to validate a story or a testimony. And then he's told them, he says, hey, I'm giving you authority over impure spirits. 
see, before this moment, it was Jesus alone who had authority and power over the, the demonic world. But now Jesus is like delegating some of his own authority, his power, and giving it to the disciples. And this meant that they were actually sent out to minister, to not, uh, to not minister in their own power and strength. They had the power and strength of the Lord. They needed to rely on him and the authority and power of Jesus and not go out on this mission alone. And Jesus told them next, he said, hey, and I want you guys to travel light. Right, put away, you know, the hiking backpacks and all of that. No, take no food, right? No extra clothes. Take no bag for money. Like, if you have a staff, you can bring that, right? A staff was like just, a, just like a walking stick that would help travelers traverse the rocky terrain in Palestine. And, 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 and essentially, by asking the disciples to travel light, Jesus was stressing the urgency of this ministry, the urgency of this play call. He's saying, hey, you need to go now, and you have everything you need. You have everything you need. And then he says, when you go into a town, here's what I want you to do. I want you to find a friendly house, a house that welcomes you, other gospels, and later, um, this will be called a person of peace. And once you find a person of peace, someone who welcomes you in, hey, don't go to another plow, a house if, you, if they cook better. Stay right there until you move on to the next town. Right? And hospitality was a huge deal in the ancient Middle East. And guess what? It's still a big deal today. Why does Jesus do this? Jesus wanted the 12 to totally depend on him for in every town they went. See, in this kingdom mission, they needed to learn, right, how to depend on God for food, for clothing, for sleep, for shelter, for their entire well-being. They were forced to trust God that he would take care of them. We don't know how long they went out for, maybe a couple days, maybe a couple weeks. We don't know. We're not told. But they do come back and report to Jesus. And Jesus reminds them. He says, oh, and by the way, hey, before you leave, before you leave, hey, don't huddle, don't break yet. Not everyone is going to accept or want to hear your message. And so when they don't, he told them, shake the dust off your feet. And, 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 and that meant essentially treating these mostly Jewish towns, which is where they were going, treating them as if they were essentially unclean pagan cities. This was actually a warning to those towns that if they continue to reject Jesus, they too would face judgment. And then not only would Jesus send out the 12 out on mission, he gave them, he says, and don't worry what you're going to say, I'm going to give you the message. And the message is the same thing that I've been preaching, the same thing that John the Baptist has been preaching, it's a message about repentance. That's it. You don't need to be a great communicator, you don't need to work on your message all week long, no, here's the message, it's essentially this, hey, repent. That means stop what you're doing. You know it's wrong, so just stop. Turn to God right now. Change from one way of life to another. Surrender everything to God. And if you do that, you'll find his forgiveness. A very simple message. And actually, at this point in time, and at this point in the mission, uh, uh, Jewish people were challenged to repent, actually, of their the self-righteousness of their religion, to embrace now the long-awaited Messiah. And so they say break, and they all got excited. And guess what? The play from Huddle worked. The disciples soon found out that they, like Jesus, had spiritual authority. They were like driving out demons. And actually, Mark tells us that they even healed people. But it's very interesting. Instead of healing people the way Jesus did, like with his words or with his touch, for whatever reason, that they began to anoint people with oil to heal them. That's interesting, right? Now, oil was used in the Old Testament sometimes as medicine. Oil was used in the Old Testament sometimes to, they would pour it over someone's head for positions of power. But oil really in many ways represents the presence of God. And it's no wonder that James picks up on this later and listen to how he reminds believers. He says, is any one of you sick? Hey, Call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be 
forgiven. So that's what the disciples were doing. Preaching, teaching, repentance, casting out demons, anointing people with oil, healing them. Can you just imagine how incredible that would have been to not just see Jesus do it as they've been doing it, but like all of a sudden like, whoa, I'm doing this. God's using me now. And so like, what does any of this mean to you? Last I checked, there's no disciple or there's no, you know, apostles here. Anyone know? They're all dead, right? What does this mean? This means this. See, Jesus sent out the 12, but this is a reminder that he's sending you and I out too. You're being sent out too. But I love that at this point in time, the disciples were still far from being formed into the incredible, powerful men that we see them later, that they would become. And I just love how Jesus didn't wait for them to understand it all and have it all figured out, right? They clearly still didn't understand who Jesus was. They clearly didn't have, you know, they didn't go to seminary or Bible college, right? And God just said, he just sent them out. You know, it's been said, a great line, that God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And the same is true for you. If you are a follower of Jesus, you're on mission with Jesus too. And sure, man, you may feel like you don't have it all together. You may feel like a hypocrite. You may feel like, man, you need to study the Bible longer. You may feel like, oh, you know, I just need to mature in my faith. And maybe all that is true. But what's not true is, you, is that you can't live sent. God is sending you out. And you're ready, no matter where you're at in the faith journey. I remember as a new Christian, man, I heard about Jesus, and I'm sure I was teaching like, you know, heresy, because I didn't know anything, but I was telling my friends, hey, I met this guy, Jesus, it's amazing, come check it out, right? I, and, and lots of my friends were coming to church and, and were interested in Jesus, not because of, of what I was saying, because I'm sure I didn't, I didn't know anything, right? They're saying, something's different about you. See, your mission, the reason why you and I exist, the reason why we're not dead yet is to live as sent people. Wherever you go to work, wherever you live, wherever you go to school, Jesus wants you and I to live on mission with him right there. This is a calling for all followers of Jesus at all stages of their growth. Yes, we should and we can come to church and huddle up, but we huddle up only to be sent out into our broken and falling and hurting world. You guys, this building is beautiful. It's just a building. This is not the church. You and I are the church. We are the people of God. You are the closest anyone is going to see is going to see Jesus. You are Jesus to your family, to your neighbors and to your friends. You really are. And this is exactly why Jesus said much later, "Peace be with you as the Father has sent me." I am sending you. I am sending you. Here's the good news. Here's the great news. Just like the disciples, here's a couple things. First, you're not alone being sent. You don't go out in your own power and strength. You have the community of the church to support you, to equip you. And you have this, some of the same power and authority as Jesus had, as the disciples has had. It, yeah, God is working in you and through you with the power of the Holy Spirit. And guess what? When you face satanic forces, you should be victorious because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. But just like the disciples, you and I must learn how to depend on God for every step of the journey. What's your message? It's the same message. Repent. Change your life. The kingdom of God is right here, right now. And so I say all that just to encourage us, just to remind us to be people who share our faith regularly, to be people who invite people into our homes and into our lives and into our church. I love the Christmas season because in my experience, especially lately, people are more open to the good news of Jesus than ever before. And Christmas is always a great opportunity to talk with them and to invite them into our holy huddle as well. And guess what? If you want to experience Advent joy this Christmas season, there is nothing more joyful 
than living for God and inviting your friends and your family and your neighbors and your coworkers to experience the real reason for Christmas along with you. Would you agree with that? Yeah, right. Well, at this point in this passage, Mark actually inserts this long story about King Herod and the awful thing he did to John the Baptist, right? He had his head cut off. And as I read just part of this passage, I want you to be thinking, because this is what I've been thinking all week, like, why would Mark include this story about what King Herod did to John the Baptist right after he sent out the 12 on mission for Jesus? And if I think if you answer that, you'll, you'll get a key to the context. And let me just read it for us. I'm going to read just part of it. In verse 14, when King Herod heard about this, that's Jesus and, and, and the disciples going out, for Jesus' name had become well known, so Jesus is getting very, very popular. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him, in Jesus. But others said, oh, no, 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 he is Elijah, come back. And still others claim, no, 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 he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. Like, oh, my gosh. So what's going on here? So the word about Jesus' ministry and his fame made it all the way to the top of society. And King Herod was not only hearing about Jesus, but he actually came to believe that Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. But then Mark tells us that others believe that it was Elijah that came back because in the Old Testament book called Micah, it was prophesied that Elijah would come back when the Lord was set to return. And then others just said, ah, he's just another prophet like all the other prophets. And then Mark, he then flashes back to this brutal story of how John the Baptist was executed at the hands of King Herod. Now, I'm not going to read all verses 17 to 29. I just want to summarize them real quick for us. And so what had happened years ago was Herod Antipas, who Mark calls King Herod, had John the Baptist imprisoned because John was speaking out against the unlawful marriage between him and Herodias, and Herodias was his brother's wife. Ew, right? And Herodias wanted to kill John because of his outspokenness, but Herod liked John. He said, you know, John's a holy guy. John's a righteous guy. I kind of like listening to him, so let's just like, you know, imprison him, and then I can have a one-on-one -on -one audience with, with, with John the Baptist. It'll be great for all of us. But one day, Herod throws this lavish and indulgent party, and the daughter of Herodias most commentators believe that she came and, and, you know, not wearing a whole lot and seductively danced in front of her, all the dinner guests, right? And so Herod is pleased. He's like, whoa, Herod. I, I, she's like, he's like, oh, man, uh, you can have whatever you want. I'll give you whatever you want, even though he was over speaking for himself, but whatever. And so she runs back to mom and says, hey, mom, Herodias, um, Herod said I can have whatever I want. What should I ask for, mommy? And mommy says, Ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Oh, that's really, Mom? Yes, honey, ask for that. Okay. And so she goes back, and she says, Hey, Herod, I want the head of John the Baptist on the platter. And Herod was torn, right? Because he didn't want to do that. But to save face in front of his dinner guests, he relented. He has John the Baptist executed. And then the story ends. And so the question is, interesting story. Why does Mark place it here? Interesting story. What is Mark trying to do to us? What does he want us to think about? See, John the Baptist was considered one of the greatest prophets who lived on mission for the Messiah. And just like the disciples, man, he traveled light. He didn't own much, didn't have much money. And he preached the same message, a message of repentance but John was martyred for his faith and for pointing people to Jesus. And so I think what Mark is doing here is he's highlighting for us the sobering reality that some will react terribly to the mission and to the message of Jesus Christ. 
I think it was a warning for the disciples and a warning to us that not everyone is going to say, oh, come right into my house. Yes, tell me more. No, some will want to cut off our heads. And before you go, whoa, whoa, Rob, whoa, like, that's a little intense, man, like, whoa. You know what? Like, I think this is a great reminder for us that around the world today, many Christians are persecuted, imprisoned, and even killed for their faith. Currently, according to the statistics that I found this week, there are well over 300 million Christians facing persecution every single day. And Christian, perse- Christian persecution can come in all kinds of different forms. Yes, actual martyrdom, but arrests, abductions, abuse, just to name a few of the ways. Every day I read 13 Christians worldwide, every day, are killed because of their faith. 12 churches or Christian buildings are attacked, and 12 Christians are unjustly arrested or imprisoned, and another five are abducted every single day day. And sadly, these numbers are growing. According to the Open Doors annual world watch list, one in eight Christians worldwide experience high levels of persecution every single day. Let that sink in for a moment. If we are the family of God, if those are our brothers and sisters, we need to remember them Pray for them. Give towards ministries that support them. Because I think Mark for us today is reminding us that, hey, as you live sent, you should expect persecution too. But let's be honest, right? The reality for us in the United States of America, right, is, you know, guess what? Like most, partly, maybe none of us will ever get killed for our faith, Our church most likely won't get burned down, and I hopefully will never get abducted, right? At least I hope not, right? But in the San Francisco Bay Area, I think we have a different, we face a different type of persecution, don't we? See, because of our Christian beliefs and things like traditional marriage, or biblical sexuality, or the rights of the unborn, among many other polarizing issues, we are now considered um, at least intolerant, maybe in the middle bigots, but at worst oppressors, right? Some of you, you've lost friends, or you've been ostracized from some of your family members because of how you vote. Some of you refuse to toe the line at your job in regard to some of these social issues, and you reluctantly resigned. I know that's true for at least one of you. At school, especially at a university like San Francisco State, many of you feel the pressure to hide your Christian beliefs and convictions because you're in the teeny tiny minority of people. And I get this because I feel this pressure every day too. And even though I don't work amongst a bunch of unbelievers, I work with mostly Christians, whenever I go outside of my bubble and and if someone finds out that I'm a pastor, you know what the first question I get? Well, it's either, either, oh, you're a pastor. Um, What does that mean? Or wait, why are you married? Priests aren't supposed to, you know, so I have to. But the second question I get is always, oh, do you allow gay people in your church then, Rob? Always. And I'm always feeling like on the defense, like I have to apologize for the headlines or, you know, or somehow I have to like explain my beliefs in like two minutes as I'm in line at Trader Joe's. Yeah, well, yeah, um, yeah, uh, oh, you're right. It's like terrifying. But here's the good news. The good news is that the church has always flourished in exile, that the church has always grown and been strengthened amidst persecution. Honestly, persecution is nothing new to the people of God. Just A, read the Bible and just look at church history, right? And in fact, it was the rejection of Jesus by society that put him on the cross. And in many ways, actually, persecution validates our mission and our message. Because I think Mark's main point for us is this. Jesus sent you out with a mission and a message, so expect opposition. I think that's what he's doing here. Jesus has sent you out, just like the disciples, with a mission, with a message 
But don't be surprised when you face persecution, because you will. You will. And if you're not, hmm, maybe you're not on the team, but you think you are, right? Maybe you're not part. I don't know. You have to think about that between you and God yourself. I was reading another missions website this week. Um, I've never heard of this group, but um, Asian Access, or A2, is this uh, Christian missions agency in South Asia, uh, Asia, and they listed a series of questions that some church planners have been asking new believers who are considering baptism. And I read this list, and I was like, <gasps> Wow. And these, follow, these, these following seven questions are, were like a reality check for these new followers of Jesus, what they might experience if they go public for their decision to follow Christ. Listen to these seven questions. Question number one, are you willing to leave home and lose the blessing of your father? Two, are you willing to lose your job? Three, are you willing to go to the village and those who persecute you Forgive them and share the love of Christ with them. Four, are you willing to give an offering to the Lord? Question number five, are you willing to be beaten rather than deny your faith? Question number six, are you willing to go to prison? And the final question they ask new converts before they get baptized is number seven, are you willing to die for Jesus? And I read those and I'm like, oh my gosh, when we baptize people here, we're just like, are you a Christian? Great, get in the water, right? That's like it. It's like, good, say the right words, great, get in, you know? <laughs> and so maybe we need to come up with some questions. And we do ask more than that, just so you guys know. <laughs> it's... But I thought about, okay, if I could rewrite these for our church, here's what I think they'd be. Here's seven questions maybe we should ask. Question number one. Are you willing for your family and your friends to not understand your decision and even reject you? Number two, are you willing to lose your job or at least hurt your career path? Number three, are you willing to forgive those who tease, mock, or persecute you and share the love of Christ with them anyway? Four, are you willing to live your life as an offering to the Lord and not seek your own agenda or plans? Five, are you willing to go public with your faith in places where it's discouraged and even despised? Six, are you willing to be canceled by culture? Seven, and the final one, are you willing to die to yourself and live for Jesus in a crazy place like the San Francisco Bay Area where many believe that you're either wasting your time or that now you're the enemy? Jesus sent us out on mission. We have a message. We have his power. But let's not be surprised when we face opposition. And so, Father, we thank you, God, and we actually, I do want to pray for the persecuted church that's gathering all around the world today. I pray for those brothers and sisters that are meeting in underground churches quietly, for those pastors that are gathering in small little villages all over the world. I pray, God, for them that they will have the courage and the faith and the encouragement to live for you, Jesus, in places where they could get at minimum in prison for their faith. And I pray for us, God, as we leave this holy huddle today, as we, as we leave these doors today, God, would you remind us from Monday to Saturday to live on mission for you too. To speak up when we need to. To share our faith when you give us the opportunity to to walk away from people or situations um, that are just not good for us. I don't know how you're moving in our hearts this morning, God, but you know what we need to do on Monday to Saturday. You know how you want us to live. You know the ways that we need to obey you that we're not. You know, God, um, the challenges we face at school or at work, God. 
And so help us this week to trust you, to obey you, and to invite others into the greatest holy huddle that the world has ever seen, the church of the living God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray. Amen.